Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, in the Secretary General's annual report last year, he referred to the United Nations being an instrument of negotiation between governments. And he said that this organization can blunt the edges of conflict between nations. It can serve a diplomacy of reconciliation. Now, those words were very much in my mind when I came to this special assembly. I had, and I still have, high hopes that we shall succeed in reconciling our points of view and achieving some constructive results in the next few days. I want, however, frankly to confess that I was disappointed by the tone and substance of the speech of the Soviet Foreign Minister yesterday. One delegate said to me afterwards, well, you know, the last three minutes of Mr. Gromyko's speech weren't so bad. Well, that may be true. It's a relative judgment. And the other 31 minutes were certainly much to be regretted. And of course, when Mr. Gromyko makes a speech of this sort, he does create a dilemma for those who follow him. Because if the speech is answered, then he says that we have been indulging in polemics. And if the speech is not answered, he claims that that proves that his accusations were true. And therefore, I do propose to answer him on one or two points in as moderate terms as possible. I pass over some of his more extravagant flights of fancy, phrases like violators of the peace, trampling the charter underfoot, consolidating colonial regimes, imperialistic intrigues, shameful fiasco and that kind of invective. And I will content myself with making the following points. First of all, Mr. Grumiko got the record wrong. He made out that this assembly is meeting to consider the presence of United States and United Kingdom troops in the Lebanon and Jordan. That is not true. <laughs> what we are really meeting to consider is the complaint of Lebanon and Jordan of interference from outside in their internal affairs and the problems resulting therefrom. Now, these complaints in Lebanon. And thirdly, he says that the United States and the United Kingdom have turned the Middle East into an arsenal. Well, in fact, we all know that nothing has done more to create tension and instability in the area than the massive supplies of Soviet arms. And these still continue. And fourthly, he accuses us of having increased tension because in the past we did not negotiate about the Middle East with the Soviet Union. Well, I won't. There's much more that I could say. The distorted account of a confidential discussion, the allegations about Germany and Italy and Turkey and Israel, the excursion to China and so on. But what I really found most depressing was the contradiction between his peaceful professions and the tone and substance of his speech. I remembered as I listened how last September he and it is just the same today. And I think that the efforts which the Soviet have made in the last few weeks to whip up fears of war, to create a kind of international hysteria I find that inconsistent with their professed desire to reduce tension. I remember once being in the law courts and the judge could not hear a female about his speech. I nevertheless hope that our discussions of these Middle Eastern problems here in this special assembly will be conducted so that a constructive result can ensue. Because I am confident that it is within our power to achieve acceptable solutions. Sir, and I think that the far-sighted proposals made by President Eisenhower yesterday in his speech were a wise development of those ideas. And as the President 
and Mr. Hammershold made clear, assistance in this field must be requested by the countries concerned, and the necessary institutions must be created in the region. This is not something which can be imposed from outside. And as President Eisenhower said, even the United States, with its great resources, would not seek a leading position in this cooperation. Now, all this seems to me to offer fruitful ground for study and for action. And we of the United Kingdom, for our part, will give such help as may be within our power to give and which is acceptable to the countries concerned. Another yesterday, and upon which we too have some positive thoughts, is that of radio propaganda directed by one country against another. Now, during, in particular, this last war, radio propaganda was an instrument of national policy. I don't believe that it is consistent with our ideas of a world order that the official radio of one country should seek to promote bloody revolutions in other countries and incidentally to congratulate itself upon its success in so doing. I believe we have to have a different standard of behavior accepted among nations. And I suggest as a first step that the United Nations should give serious consideration the possibility of reports being submitted to member states at periodic intervals on the kind of material which is being broadcast throughout the world. Thirdly, dealing with the broader considerations, there is the question of a permanent United Nations force. Many of us have been given thought to this matter also and have been awaiting with interest the report which is to be made by the Secretary General during the next session of the General Assembly. Now that is all I wish to say about the broader and longer term aspects of these matters. I want now to revert to the situation in Jordan and to the British action there. I wish to state the reason for our action and our intentions for the future. Our general objectives can be stated simply. We wish to preserve the independence and integrity of small countries. That has been the aim of our policies throughout the years. It is intrinsic in our attitude to nationalism. And we have done as much as any other country to promote nationalism, and a great deal more than other countries to create new nations. During the last hundred years or so, the nine other members of the Commonwealth have become... Our troops are not in Jordan for any military purpose of their own. Their presence does not constitute a threat to any country. And we shall at any time withdraw those troops if the lawful government of Jordan requests it, or if suitable arrangements are made to protect Jordan from external threat and to maintain its independence and integrity. I would also hope that the Assembly would seek to further the longer-term proposal, to which I have already referred, and which could make so great a contribution to peace and stability. I'm sure that such an approach, as I have outlined, merits the cooperation of all governments here concerned, whatever their views. And I think by such action, the Assembly will have met the challenge presented to it by the events of the past few weeks. We'll hear the representatives of Jordan, Australia, Ireland and Czechoslovakia. The assembly is adjourned until 3 p.m. today.